ओम सरशिव समारंभा शंकराचार्य मध्यम अस्मराचार्य पर्यथा वंदे गुरुपरम ओम परमेश्वर ओम सहनावतु सहनौ भुनक्त सह वीर्यन घर वह तेजस्वीनावधीतमस्तु मिषा वह ओ गुड नाइस टू सी ऑल ऑफ यू दिस मॉर्निंग for our class and welcome to everyone watching this class online uh we'll continue today our study of uh, chapter 9 on knowledge of ishvara who is that one that we pray to or worship and we'll cont- we'll begin with some recitation beginning with verse 25 and As always as I'm chanting be sure to read the translation and then repeat after me Yanti deva vrata devan Yanti deva vrata devan Pitran yanti pitra vrata Pitran yanti pitra vrata Bhutani yanti bhutejya भूतानि यांति भूते ज्या यांति मध्याजिनो पिमाम यांति मध्याजिनो पिमाम पत्रम पुष्पम फलम तोयम पत्रम पुष्पम फलम तोयम यो मे भक्त्या प्रयच्छति यो मे भक्त्या प्रयच्छति थर हम भक्तुप थर हम भक्तुप अश्ना प्रयथात्म अश्ना प्रयथात्म यत्खरोषि यशनासी यत्खरोषि यशनासी यज्जुहोषि दासीयत यज्जुहोषि दासीयत यपस्यसिखाउंथे यपस्यसिखाउंथेकुष्वर्पण तत्कुष्वर्पण शुभा शुभबलाव शुभा शुभफलाव मोक्षसे कर्म बंधन मोक्षसे कर्म बंधन संयास योग युक्तात्मा संयास योग युक्ता विमुक्त मामुफ्यसी विमुक्त मामुफ्यसी समोहम सर्वभूतेषु समोहम सर्वभूतेषु न मे ष्योस्ति न प्रिय न मे ष्योस्ति न प्रिय ये भजन्ति तु मां भक्त्या ये भजन्ति तु मां भक्त्या मयि थे थे शुचाप्यहम मयि थे थे शुचाप्यहम वेरी गुड बैक अप हियर नाउ वी बिगिन टुडे ऑन 26 वेरी नाइस सो वी हैव बीन सीइंग नाउ 
towards the end of this chapter on jnana and vijnana, knowledge of, of Ishvara. Um, towards the end, we have this section on worship. How do we worship? How do we worship that one who is beyond imagination? Ultimately, we've talked about both the uh, sakara and nirakara aspects, sakara or saguna, Ishvara with qualities. Also, the one who is nirguna, free from qualities. We've used words like imminent and transcendent. What does that mean in terms of our worship? So we've had some fairly complex discussions leading up to this point. Tell me, and, and just, just an interesting way to begin today's class, how do those complex, deep philosophical discussions about the nature of Ishvara, Saguna, Nirguna, etc., how does that enter into our daily prayer and worship? And probably the answer is not that much because prayer and worship is a matter of of the heart a matter of the emotions and not a matter of all this intellectual understanding so then how do we connect the two and let me just offer you offer you a uh, i guess a personal observation um, because i came to these teachings as a young man, having completely rejected the religion of my childhood, including rejecting the possibility of any kind of Ishvara, any kind of God. And what I found was, and this may or may not be the case for you, but it was very much the case for me, is that before I could even begin to consider any kind of prayer or worship, my intellect needed to be convinced that it was okay. <laughs> that is, there was this intellectual resistance in me to any form of prayer or, medit or, or worship. And fortunately, the way these teachings of Vedanta were presented by my guru, Puja Swamiji, um, my intellectual resistance was quickly removed and then over a period of time the emotions followed, the, the desire and, and appreciation of various forms of prayer and worship. So this chapter kind of follows that pattern. This chapter began with these fairly technical teachings about who and what is Ishvara, and now we come to the final part of the chapter. I think we'll finish the chapter next week. Um, and in this final part, part, we're talking about worship. And you'll see that the nature of the verses changed very dramatically. We're no longer dealing with profound Vedantic teachings. We're now talking about teachings of the heart, so to speak. Teachings that help us connect emotionally with that one who created the universe. We'll see that as, as we begin today. One last uh, point of introduction is that um, uh, Sri Krishna apparently is, is kind of um, against complicated rituals. He's against ritualism. Um, he spoke, and, and especially, the use of Vedic rituals to go to heaven. In fact, this topic came way back in chapter two when he was introducing karma yoga for the first time. He was highly critical there of those who would engage in these complex rituals to try to accumulate enough good karma to reach heaven. He was highly critical for two reasons. One is, first of all, heaven is temporary, as we discovered, you get a, you get a birth in heaven, so it's not the ultimate goal of spiritual or religious life. But for the second reason, and we, I've, you've heard me use the term several times, spiritual materialism, to use spiritual and religious techniques, practices, for the sake of fulfilling your desires. What is spiritual about that? Using prayer and worship and puja for the sake of fulfilling desires. That sounds quite worldly. 
which is exactly why one Buddhist teacher called it uh, spiritual materialism. Sri Krishna is very much aware of that problem and he spoke in chapter 2 against excessive ritualism and you'll see he contin continues with that, a little, not quite so vehemently, but he continues with that theme as we continue here. <coughs> we can pick up the thread with verse 26. Patram pushpam palam toyam Patram pushpam palam toyam Yo me bhaktya prayachati Yo me bhaktya prayachati Taraham bhaktyupahritam Taraham bhaktyupahritam Ashnami prayatatmanaha Ashnami prayatatmanaha Some of you will recognize this verse. It's frequently quoted from the Bhagavad Gita. Start in the uh, second line. Yaha, yaha, one who prayachati offers, offers me unto me, one who offers unto me what? First line, patram, a leaf, pushpam, a flower, palam, a fruit, toyam, water. So notice he is talking now about the worship of ordinary materials, not the, uh, in a typical yajna, the Vedic ritual, fire sacrifice, the main offering was ghee. And something that we, we need to remember, that is, in ancient times, ghee was very costly. Today you go into a market and for a few dollars you can buy some ghee, I suppose. But in ancient times, it took a large quantity of milk to produce a little bit of ghee. Milk itself was, was costly in ancient times. And what to speak of the little bit of ghee, a large quantity of milk produces. So have in your mind, whenever you're, we're talking about offering ghee into a sacrificial fire, it's offering something of great value. That's that we, we need to be aware of that. So here, Sri Krishna is taking the opposite approach. He's talking about things not of great value like ghee. He's talking about very ordinary things. Leaves. And any kind of leaf. You know, sometimes we'll offer like a bilva leaf, a special leaf for, for Lord Shiva. Tulsi leaves perhaps for Lord Vishnu. But here he's saying any kind of leaf. Go out and, and go out in your backyard of your home and pick up some leaves and you can offer them at your altar or any kind of flower, fruit, even water. It says whatever you offer, but there's a very crucial word here and the word is bhaktiya, with bhakti, with devotion. Whatever you worship with devotion is, and Sri Krishna says, Tadaham, that, tat, that offering, aham, I, last line, ashnami, literally, I eat, but the idea is, I accept whatever you offer, uh, whatever, uh, ashnami, whatever, whatever is upachritam, whatever is offered, bhaktiya, the, the word comes here also, uh, Bhakti upahritam is a compound. Whatever is offered with, with uh, bhakti, with worship. We've spoken before about the importance of intention in doing, in doing anything at all in life, but in doing rituals in particular, worship in particular. So the intention with which you do and first of all, the broader sense. The intention with which you do anything, like taking care of your home. Is taking care of your home a nuisance and a burden? Or is taking care of your home creating a beautiful, clean, comfortable place for you and your family to live? Attitude makes a big difference, doesn't it? Or if you go to a job, are you going to job, oh, <coughs> <laughs> Monday will come pretty soon, I have to go to work again. If 
what is your attitude and intention? On the other hand, if you're going to work to, again, to support your family, for example. Other reasons, too. You might find some personal satisfaction in your work. That's good. Attitude and intention are extraordinarily important in everything we do, and even more so when it comes to prayer and worship. So look at the difference between the, the uh, typical prayer. Hey, Bhagavan, please give me this, please give me that. I've joked with you, ye de do, ye bi de do. Give me this, give me that. <laughs> and bear in mind, that's still a good prayer. There's nothing wrong with that prayer. But compare that to another prayer. Hey, Bhagavan, thank you for all that you have given. I think in the last class I mentioned every beat of your heart can be understood. If you have this attitude of devotion, bhakti, then you will understand every beat of your heart is a gift of God, a gift of Ishvara. So no doubt there are plenty of problems in your life, and we can certainly go ahead and pray for, pray for help in coping with those many problems you face. But what about this prayer of gratitude? The problems are a fact. The blessings in your life are equally a fact. Is that not true? Both are true. Problems are a fact. Blessings are also a fact. So to be aware of those blessings will empower you to pray with a much nicer attitude and intention that is much more pure. Pure in the sense that not driven by desire. Going back to this, this prayer, hey Bhagavan, ye de do, ye bhi de do, give me this, give me that. Isn't that a form of spiritual materialism? You're praying, you're, you're enlist, I've, I've joked with you before, you're enlisting Bhagavan's help to help you deal with your problems, and your prayer is like some bakshish, some... <laughs> you have to, in order for Bhagavan to help you, you have to give him something so that he'll be inspired to help you. Again, this is not to say you shouldn't pray in that way. That form of prayer is not wrong or incorrect. But clearly, it is not an ideal form. Of prayer. It's not the most pure form of prayer because it's tainted by desire. So a prayer of gratitude is a prayer of desire. Or even there's another way of, of understanding this bhakti. If you, if you are praying, then if you are praying to fulfill desires, if you are praying to, for help to deal with, with the problems in your life, then even that prayer can be at a so-called higher level. Hi, by higher level, I mean your prayer is not an attempt to persuade Ishra to bless you. That's the more immature attitude. That's a bakshish kind of attitude, that your prayer makes God bless you. But if your prayer is a heartfelt appreciation that everything is in Ishvara's hands, and you really recognize Ishvara as karma pala data, as the giver of karma pala, the fruits of our deeds, to have that and <laughs> deeper appreciation of who and what Ishvara is. To pray with that sense of appreciation. Even if you're praying for help with particular problems, to pray not in this very mechanical way, oh God, give me this, give me that, but to pray with this heartfelt sense of connectedness and, un and sense of, there's a sense of intimacy that grows. I, I, think, I gave this example, I think in the last class or prior class, that intimacy depends on knowledge. And the example I gave you is if you were married in an arranged marriage, 
At first, you, barely, you hardly know your spouse, and there's very little sense of intimacy at first, but once you've been together for months and years, your understanding of each other grows and grows and grows. As your understanding grows, intimacy grows. If that works for your, for your spouse in an arranged marriage, it most certainly works when we're speaking of bhakti here. So intention means everything. What is the attitude or intention with which you're engaged in this? In, in this? <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing. Um, yeah, sometimes teaching this topic, a, a hilarious story comes to mind about intention. And it had, this is a story told by my guru, Pujya Swami Dayananda. It is, I, do, I just have to share it with you. It's, 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 a few of you may have heard it long ago. So the, there is a, uh, a man and his wife. They are sitting at a ritual fire with a priest. And a priest is guiding them through a fairly complex set of instructions to perform this ritual. There are some preliminary ritual, rituals. You worship Lord Ganesha. Then finally, there's a fire that started in the Havankund, the, the fire pit, and they're making various offerings. They're also using water to purify various things. Sometimes water is used. You have to purify yourself by sipping water. So the priest gives this guy some water and says, sip it, you know, and, and you know, speaking speaking in, what, in whatever language. Maybe the priest is speaking in, in Hindi and maybe the people don't quite follow the Hindi properly and they get a little confused. It's, it's complicated and sometimes priests are a little bit in a hurry and so it's going on very quickly. So, so, so you know, um, the priest instructs a person, take some water and drink it. So you have to take, take the, uh, with your left hand, you have to all do all this wrong. You, with your left hand, you take some water from this uh, pot, patra, you pour it in your right hand and you sip it. And then at other points, um, you have to take with your right hand, you have to take a ladle, take some ghee and put it in the fire. So there are all these complicated things. This poor fellow got so confused at one point in the ritual, the, the priest is pointing to, pointing, to, pointing to the ghee, not to the water. He's pointing to the ghee and he's very excited. And his fellow takes the spoon of ghee, puts it in the, in the uh, puts the spoon in the ghee. <laughs> and instead of putting it in the fire, <laughs> puts it in his mouth. And the priest is just aghast. No, 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 in the fire. And this poor fellow doesn't know what to do. So he, <laughs> he, he, spit, <laughs> he spits it in the fire. Now, now the priest <laughs> is aghast. What about Ishvara? Any problem? What was this fellow's intention? Isn't that what counts? So offering ghee, spit out of your mouth, is, accepted to, is acceptable to Ishvara if it is offered with a pure heart. Bhaktya bhakti upahrata. If it is offered, and also the last word prayatat manaha, if it is an offering of one, atma here means heart, mind. One whose heart is prayata has the various meanings. Here we'll say pure. So one for one who has a pure heart, even spitting ghee out of your mouth <laughs> into a ritual fire is acceptable to Ishra. Why? Intention. It's all a matter of intention. Let's continue. Yat karo shi Yat karo shi yadashnasi, yad juho shi dadasi yata, yad juho shi dadasi yata, yad tapas yasi kaunte ya, yad tapas yasi kaunte ya, tat kuru shwamararpanam, tat kuru shwamararpanam. Continuing to talk about intention. Look at the last line. 
Tat Kurushvad, you should do that. He's addressing Arjuna. What you should do that, Mararpanam. Mar is a pronoun me. You should do that as an offering to me. What should you do as an offering to me? Go back up to the uh, top. Yat Karoshi, whatever you do. Yat Karoshi, Mararpanam Tat Kuru. Whatever you do, do as an offering to me. Which means when you're cleaning your home or cooking a meal, mararpanam. If you are going to work on Monday morning, mararpanam. Whatever you do, do as an offering of me. Does that sound a little bit like karma yoga? It should. <laughs> and it turns out that there's this distinction we make between karma yoga and bhakti is a very arbitrary distinction. If you're, if you're in front of an altar or if you are in front of a, a sacred fire, we call it bhakti, but if you're in the kitchen or in front of a computer, it's also bhakti if you have the right attitude. It doesn't make any difference. You can perform rituals in, in to, to worship Ishvara, but if you're fulfilling your duties in your home or workplace, isn't that also worship of Ishvara? It is if capital IF, capital I-F, the work you do at home or in, in front of a computer is worship of Ishvara, if you have that attitude. It's all intention. So yet karoshi, whatever you do, do it kurushva, you should do it mararpanam, as an offering to me, Sri Krishna says. Yadashnasi, whatever you eat, do that as an offering of me. You know, back in chapter 4, we saw that Brahmarpanam Brahmahavi, that, that beautiful verse that's often chanted at mealtime, where you recognize that whatever you eat is being offered to Ishvara present in you in the form of the power of digestion. You can go look at, by the way, go, go, uh, go, when you go home, look at that verse. If I, I think I remember the number correctly. Uh, chapter 4, verse 24. Brahmarpanam, Brahmahavihi, Brahmagnao, Brahmanahutam. I don't want to explain the verse right now. Go and look at that verse. It talks about how the act of eating a meal is a form of worship if you recognize Ishvara's presence there at the time of the meal. You recognize that, <coughs> that, that, I, I have to explain at least. From, so, so, Brahma Havihi, the food that you're offering, is being offered Brahmagnao into the Agni, the fire of digestion, which is Brahman. And this is the, the, the not only beautiful way of transforming an ordinary act of eating into an act of worship, but also it points out the irony. You're offering, you're offering that which, that uh, the word you use, havis, the sacrificial offering, is being offered unto Ishvara. Who's, wh where did that sacrificial offering come from? That sacrificial offering is a manifestation of Ishvara. The spoon or ladle on which the uh, offering rests is, is a manifestation of Ishvara. The fire of digestion unto which it's being offered is a manifestation of Ishvara. And the one who's doing the offering is a manifestation of Ishvara. As we've said, it's all Ishvara. Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma. All this is nothing but Brahma, all this is nothing but Ishvara. There's an irony in this. In a prior verse, we talked about offering a leaf, flower, water. Tell, tell me, that, f that flower you're offering, where did that flower come from? It came from a plant. How did that plant get there? 
how does anything exist at all? Everything that exists, exists because it's a manifestation of Vishra. Here we bring in a little bit of Vedanta, but look, how, look at the irony that arises as soon as we bring this Vedanta. As soon as you recognize everything is a manifestation of Vishra, then the flower you offer at the altar, or the water, or the fruit, or the leaf, whose flower is it? Whose leaf is it? It's, it's, you're, you're taking Ishwara's off flower and giving it back to him. You know, this irony, uh, you know, in the Arati song, Jaya Jagadisha Hare, uh, there's that beautiful line, Tera Tujako Arapana, Tera Tujako Arapana, Tera, what is yours? Tujako unto you, Arpana, I offer. Kya mera laga? What is mine? Everything is yours. So un, unto you I offer what is already yours because what choice do you have? Everything is Ishvara. Everything is of Ishvara. Anyway, that beautiful imagery is very powerfully present in that verse 24 of chapter 4, which, which is nice to recite before a meal to transform that ordinary act of a meal into an act of, act of worship. Here Sri Krishna says, Yarashnasi, whatever you eat, tat kurushwa mararpanam, do that as an offering to me. Yet juhoshi, whatever you offer, obviously, whatever you offer into that ritual fire, do that as an offering to me. And yet dadasi, dadasi yat, Whatever you give, do that as an offering to me. Whatever you give to your family, whatever you give to your friends, even whatever you give, you give to your employer. You may not like your <laughs> employer, your boss, but attitude. If you realize that it's easier with your family, you can you, by serving your family, by taking care of your family, you are fulfilling dharma, fulfilling your responsibilities, and to fulfill your dharma is to worship Ishvara. We've had this discussion before. This is a primary principle, not the only principle of karma yoga, but a primary principle of karma yoga by fulfilling Filling your duties, your responsibilities by following dharma, that is worship of Ishvara. So when you're fulfilling your duties at home, if you have that attitude, you are worshiping Ishvara. If you're fulfilling your duties at the workplace, if you have that attitude, you're not working to please your boss working to please, so to speak, Ishvara. Okay, this, this verse intentionally blurs the line between karma yoga and bhakti because that line is arbitrary. And in the next verse we'll see more about how and why that distinction is, is, is arbitrary. Let's go on and see that. <coughs> shubha shubha palar hevam Shubha shubha palar hevam Moksha se karma bandhanaihi Moksha se karma bandhanaihi Sanyasa yoga yuktatma Sanyasa yoga yuktatma Vimukto mamu paishyasi, vimukto mamu paishyasi. In the second line comes the verb, mokshyase. You will be freed, the future, and in the second person, yeah, she, here Sri Krishna addresses Arjuna, but in a manner of speaking, he's addressing us all. So, connecting it to the prior verse, by offering everything we do unto Sri Krishna, unto Ishvara, in this way, 
moksha say you will be freed from what? Shubha, ashubha, palaihi, evam. Evam thus. Thus is reaching back to the prior verse by living with this attitude. We call this attitude Ishwara Arpana Buddhi. Ishwara, God, Arpana, offering. Buddhi here means attitude. That attitude of offering everything to Ishwara, Ishwara, Arpana, Buddhi, evam, thus, with that attitude, moksha say, as a result of that attitude, moksha say, you will be freed, shubha, ashubha, palaihi, from the so-called good and bad karmas, which are karma bandhanaihi, which are the cause for being bound by karma. And this idea of karma, of karma bandha, what does it mean to be bound by karma? Conventionally, uh, two ways of understanding it. The conventional way is that you are in a state of bondage, you are bound to get reborn. You have no choice. You will get reborn and you will, it, the life into which you're born will involve suffering. So it's not just bound to karma, not just bound to rebirth, it's being bound to suffering. To be in a state of bondage is to be continually subject to suffering. The secondary meaning of this is, is to be bound to karma means to be dependent on actions for the sake of your contentment and happiness that very worldly attitude of being utterly dependent on your own actions for the sake of contentment. And we've discussed so many times the how misdirected that ordinary way of thinking is. You think that your contention, I'm sorry, you think that your contentment Wrong word, where did, where did that come from? You think that your contentment depends on you doing A, B, C, D, and E in order to get contentment. Suppose you can only do A, B, and C. No contentment. That leads to a life of constant struggle. Not fun. Suppose, with the help of these teachings, you've discovered that contentment is already within you and all you need to do is apply these teachings to appreciate that contentment which is your true nature. And this is our basic discussion that we had starting way back in chapter 2. I won't go further on it, but with these teachings, if you recognize your true that the true source of contentment is within, you're not dependent then on having your, your actions produce contentment for you. Therefore, if you can only do A, B, and C, and you can't do D and E, you can still be content and you can even enjoy doing A, B, and C, even if you can't do D and E, whatever you do, you can enjoy. The pressure is off. If the pressure, if, if you are, f if you, through your daily actions, bear the full burden of producing happiness and contentment for your, not just for you, for your family members and friends also. What a terrible burden. Who can enjoy a life like that? On the other hand, with the help of these teachings, when you discover the true source of contentment within you, that sense of burden of the life goes away. You can do everything you want to do, but you can do it without that tension or that sense of burden associated with it. That's the second way of understanding this karma bandha, this bondage of karma. So both in the sense of you are bound to be reborn, and into a life of suffering is one meaning, and the second is you're bound to this very worldly attitude of having to work very hard for the sake of contentment, and that causes suffering. So 
moksha se, Sri Krishna says, you will be freed from all of this bondage. How? Now, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to take the contrary point of view. We call it purva pakshi. Purva pakshi is the one who takes the, the opposing point of view to make a point. Ah, in, in Western literature, it's called devil's advocate. You know that term. So the devil's advocate position in Sanskrit we call Purva Pakshi. So here the Purva Pakshi says, wait a minute. Are you saying all you have to do is offer some, some ghee into a fire and all your problems go away? All you have to do is offer some flowers at an altar and all your problems go away? Sri Krishna says, moksha say, you will be freed from the bondage of karma. All you have to do is offer some water. All you have to do is spit some ghee. <laughs> and do a, what a story. <laughs> and so you, you see the point of the, the devil's advocate position here is, is, is that what it means? Is all you have to do is just some little prayer? We have to understand the bigger picture. And that's what Sri Krishna makes it very clear in the next line. It's, it's not mere acts of prayer and devotion. Acts of prayer and devotion are very important. But that's not all of religious and spiritual life. There's more to a life of spiritual growth than prayer and worship. And he says in the last line, in the next line, third line, Sanyasa yoga yuktatma vimuktaha. The one who is vimukta, the one who becomes freed, is one who is sanyasa yoga yukta atma. Here again, atma means mind. The one whose mind is yukta, endowed with sanyasa yoga. Now, don't take it literally. It doesn't mean becoming a sannyasi. Sannyasa means renunciation. But what kind of renunciation? And if you remember long ago, our study in chapters 4 and 5, we had long discussions, important discussions, about Sri Krishna's use of the word sannyasa, renunciation, to talk about giving up the sense of being the doer, the sense of agency, giving up ego, that sense of I and mine. Now, in order to explain this, I'd like it would be helpful to get the big picture. How does this bhakti and karma yoga fit in? How does bhakti and karma yoga lead to moksha? Not you, you can already appreciate that the mere performance of prayer and rituals is not enough. So what is the big picture? Let me go to the board and try to give you uh, a broader perspective. Where is the board? The board is here. All right. <clears throat> So first of all, we have these so-called four yogas, and we'll make that step one. And we speak of, am I too high? Oh, that's a little too high. Thank you. Let me make sure that comes on the screen. So on the first step, we have these so-called four yogas, bhakti yoga, karma yoga, Dhyana yoga, meditation, and jnana yoga, the pursuit of knowledge. <clears throat> now, we've had this discussion before. I'll just remind you which of these leads to moksha, and I'm hopefully, I'm hoping all of you can answer correctly all of them together lead to moksha. If you exclude any one of these, you're in trouble. Who can say, I don't need bhakti? Who can say, I don't need karma yoga? We, you've heard me say many times, 
we need all the help we can get. How can we possibly exclude any of these? So we need them all. And why do we need them all? Now here we have to, again, uh, come back to some central teachings of Vedanta. And the central teaching of Vedanta is tat tvam asi, you are that, and allow me to paraphrase, you already are that, already are that. You don't become that. You are that, which means your true nature is already divine, already satchitananda atma, already full and complete, already the source of contentment, peace, and joy is already there. You are already that. You've heard me say before that the Mahavakyas like Tattvamasi are all in the present tense, not in the future tense. None of the Mahavakyas say you will become that. They all say you are that. Your true nature is already that divinity. Then why do we suffer so much in life? You can answer, I'm pretty sure you can all answer that question. We suffer because of the failure to recognize that inner truth. The non, to use my guru's language, the non-recognition of your true nature leads to suffering. Failing to recognize the true source of contentment within, we seek it out in the world and therefore we live a life of struggle and suffering. So non-recognition is a fancy word for ignorance. The problem is ignorance. So if the problem is ignorance, the problem is failure to recognize your true nature, the, failure, the problem is the so-called veil of ignorance that covers your true nature, if the problem is ignorance, the solution is knowledge. How can it be anything else? The solution is knowledge. But that knowledge is not ordinary knowledge. And for, for ordinary knowledge, you need ordinary preparation. For extraordinary knowledge, you need extraordinary preparation. These teachings and all of these practices culminate in moksha only if you're ready, only if you're adequately prepared. Long ago, you remember my example of someone who takes a college course in calculus and in spite of trying so hard, they flunk miserably because they never studied algebra and, and trigonometry and other prerequisites. There are prerequisites for college curricula. There are prerequisites for gaining knowledge of your true nature. One who possesses those prerequisites, we have a special name for that person, we call such a person an adhikari. Now, not in the Hindi sense of the meaning of the word. Adhikari in the sense of a prepared student. So step two is adhi, I'll say adhikara, preparation or preparedness. So, what is necessary for, we said, or, for an ordinary knowledge, you need ordinary preparation. For extraordinary knowledge, you need extraordinary preparation. To, be, to gain adhikara, preparedness, for knowledge of your true nature, as Satchirananda, for that extraordinary knowledge, you need extraordinary preparation. Trick question, which of these gives you that extraordinary preparation? And you, you get it. All of them are required to give you that 
extraordinary preparation. Now you can see why it's so arbitrary to make divisions amongst these. They're all meant to be practiced together. In American English, they call it a package deal. It's a, pa <laughs> it's a package deal. They all come together. They're all meant to, get to be practiced together. You don't get to pick and choose. And that's a modern concept, which is so contrary to what the ancient rishis actually taught. You don't get to pick and choose. You require them all. If, if you're going to, to prepare a meal, do you get to pick and choose? If you're going to, if you're going to, I, I shouldn't give a cooking example. I don't know cooking. Anyway, whatever you're, you need, if, okay, if, you, <laughs> if you're going to make, what do you call this? Alu gobi. <laughs> I'll show off my great cooking knowledge. Do you get, do you, uh, <laughs> so you, you, need, you need potatoes and you need um, cauliflower. Do you get to pick one or the other? You need both. And you, do, and you need other ingredients as well. So you, it's a package deal. So that's what I mean here. We require all of these to, get, to gain adhikara, preparedness, then with the preparedness, preparedness plus three factors, guru, shastra, and adhikara. Guru, teacher, shastra, teachings, and adhikari, a prepared student. So you put alu and gobi in a pot with some water. Here, the three ingredients are Guru, who helps you understand the scripture, Shastra, the scripture together, and Adhikari, a prepared student. You put those three ingredients in a pot. Sorry to mix the metaphors. You put the three ingredients in the pot, and what do you get? Well, what you get, to use the right word here, is, we'll say, Atma Jnana, Self-knowledge, Atma Jnana, there we go, self-knowledge, and in particular, knowledge that you are Satchirananda Atma, utterly independent of the body and mind, pure consciousness, which is utterly unaffected by anything in the world, pure consciousness which is unborn, uncreated, and unchanging. That pure consciousness is, to use the Western philosophical term, transcendent. Transcendent means not engaged in worldly activities. Not engaged in worldly activities means that consciousness, that atma, the essence of who you are, is independent of the world, independent of your body and mind. Your consciousness is not an agent of action. That's, we've had this discussion. That was a big topic back in chapters 4 and 5. Your consciousness is not an agent of action. Notice in this verse, Sri Krishna uses the word sannyasa yoga. That's what he's referring to. That sannyasa, that renunciation, is a renunciation of agency. This knowledge destroys that sense of agency. Do I have room on that? Yeah. I'm just checking the monitor here. So this self-knowledge removes that sense of agency. And to use some conventional language, this would be a whole class to explain, but I'm just going to say there is the destruction, not just of ignorance, but of the sense of agency. 
the sense that I did it, I do everything. Your body and mind are engaged in actions, absolutely. Not consciousness. This is a lofty teaching. Of course, we're right at the bottom of the, of the list. This is almost where, where it concludes. But here's, here's the point Sri Krishna is making here. When you have, have practiced all of, all of these, and if you want to add some more on, you can add as many practices as you want, whatever it takes to become an adhikari, a prepared student, then with the help of the Shastra and Guru, then you gain Atma Jnana, self-knowledge, you know that your consciousness is transcendent, not engaged in actions, that knowledge then, destro- jnana, that knowledge then destroys that false sense of agency, the false ego, ahankara is the term we use. The false sense of agency, ego or ahankara, is destroyed. That's what Sri Krishna calls sannyasa yoga. And the result of that is moksha. And that might be off the screen, that's okay. So that's the moksha is the culmination then. So notice, moksha is not the immediate result of bhakti. Nor is moksha the immediate result of karma or dhyana, meditation, karma yoga or meditation. Nor is moksha the immediate result of jnana, spiritual knowledge, if you're not an adhikari. (laughs) If you're not an adhikari, if you're not a prepared student, you can get all of this scriptural knowledge and still be in a state of bondage. So the first state, first step, is gaining preparedness. Then that prepared student, with the help of Guru and Shastra, gains self-knowledge, knowledge knowledge of the reality of oneself. With that self, that self-knowledge immediately destroys that false sense of agency. And that's what Sri Krishna calls here sannyasa yoga. We'll come back to the verse in just a moment. And the the outcome of that giving up the sense of agency, you are freed from the karma bandha. So Sri Krishna is talking about moksha, not in a general sense, but being freed from the bondage of karma. You're freed from the bondage of karma because karma belongs to the agent of action. If you do an action, who possesses the result? To whom does the result of an action come? To the doer of the action? But when that sense of doership, the false doership, the ahankara, is destroyed with the help of his teachings, then that karma doesn't belong anymore. There is the possession of that karma is destroyed. That's what Sri Krishna means here by sannyasa yoga, giving you moksha. Let's see that. That one. So, sannyasa yoga yuktatma, one who, one whose atma, mind, is yukta endowed with sannyasa yoga, and here sannyasa yoga means knowledge that your true nature, as Satchitananda atma, is not an agent of action. Is it? Your true nature as consciousness is as a transcendent reality, a transcendent transcendent reality beyond worldly activities. And in this way, vimuktaha, that person becomes freed from the bondage of karma. And mam upaishyasi, Sri Krishna says to Arjuna, upaishyasi, you will reach Mom, you will reach me, who's already present here. There's another irony here. I'd like to, let, I'd like to see the next verse, because the next verse talks about that irony. What, reach this process that we just, uh, we just saw. Culminates. Sri Krishna likes to use the language. Instead of saying you become, you be, you become liberated, he likes to use the language, you reach me. 
And we'll see that why he uses that language in the next verse. Samoham sarva bhuteshu. Samoham sarva bhuteshu. Name dweshosti na priyaha. Name dweshosti na priyaha. Ye bhajanti tu mam bhaktya. Ye bhajanti tu mam bhaktya. Maite te shu chapyaham. Maite te shu chapyaham. So Sri Krishna says, Samaha aham sarva bhuteshu. Sarva bhuteshu in all beings. Aham, I, I am samaha the same. I am the same in all beings. Now, there are actually. I'd like to share this with you. Actually, we may see first half. I'm looking at the clock. Maybe we'll see the first half of this verse now. Maybe the second half in our next class. Let's see how we go. We're in, we're, um, there are some important teachings here, and I don't want to shortcut anything. There are two ways of understanding that line, and it turns out that Shankaracharya, in his commentary, takes it in one way, and Madhusudana Saraswati in his commentary takes it another way. And look at this. When Sri Krishna says, I am the same in all beings, you can understand that in two ways. One, as Madhusudana understands it, I exist identically, samaha. I exist identically in all beings. Name dveshyaha. For me, no one is dvesha hated or name priyaha loved. And according to Madhusudna, we would say then, there is no one in whom Ishvara is less present, dvesha hated, or priyaha, there is no one in whom Ishvara is more present. Ishvara is samaha, Sri Krishna says, I calling himself as, referring to himself as Ishvara, I am equally present in all beings. I am not more present in some beings and less present in some beings. Shankara will, has another interpretation. He says, uh, according to Shankara, he says, Aham Samaha, I am the same, which means I have the same perspective Sarva Bhuteshu, towards all people. I feel the same towards all people. I look upon all people as being the same. No may dveshyaha, may for me, there's no one dveshyaha, no one that I hate. No may priyaha, no one that I love in a special way. No one who is uniquely special, no one I hate. So we have these two interpretations here. Let me make a point here. So uh, Madhusudana says the first line, I am equally present in all beings. Sri Shankara would say, I, have, I look upon all with the same attitude. Now, we'll, we'll get the, the details of the verse in the next class, but here's a point I'd like to share with you. We'll conclude the class with this. Which interpretation is correct? Everyone gets this, this, Swamiji, which interpretation is correct? Is it this? Is it that? Which, tell me which is the correct interpretation. And we've actually discussed this at least once before. Who said there is one right interpretation? A correct interpretation is an interpretation that is First of all, literally accurate, but more than that, consistent with the entire text from beginning to end, and even consistent with the entire tradition, which is why you cannot take a verse out of context. If you take a verse out of context, you can interpret the words in ways that are not consistent with the entire text. In order to interpret any verse properly, 
It has to be interpreted in the context of the entire scripture, the entire text. So when Madhusudana Saraswati says, interprets this, where he says, Sri Krishna says, I am equally present in all beings. That is a correct interpretation because it is an accurate interpretation of the words and it is consistent with the entire text. And when Sri Krishna, I'm sorry, when Shankaracharya interprets it differently by saying, I look upon everyone as being the same. No me priyaha, no one is specially dear to me. No me dveshyaha, no one is hated by me. I have this attitude of equanimity towards all. Shankara's interpretation, quite different. It's also correct. It's correct, why? It's consistent with the words and it's consistent with the whole text. So when we pick up any scripture, here, here the, the message has to be, we need to understand everything in context. One of the most harmful things that's been done to all the world's religions, not just Hinduism, this problem occurs in all religious traditions where verses or statements are taken out of context and they are, to use a modern words, you take a statement out of context, then you weaponize it. Being deadly serious, scriptures are weaponized. They're used to support harmful behaviors and harmful teachings. What a shame when this concept of jihad is excerpted from the Quran and perverted, pardon my strong language, perverted in such a way that it justifies killing innocent people. What, how can that possibly be consistent with the entire teachings of the Quran. You get my point? There might be a, they call it surah. There might be a surah, a statement in the Quran that speaks of jihad, but that statement must be understood in the context of the entire scripture. To do otherwise is to do harm to the scriptural tradition. That's true for Islam, that's true in Christianity and Judaism, it's true in every religion, and it's true here. So, for example, to, to, to take a, uh, as an example here, to say Sri Krishna says, only those who worship Sri Krishna gain this adhikari tvam and gain moksha, which means if you worship Lord Shiva, you're out of luck. <laughs> That kind of narrow interpretation is absolutely contrary to the spirit of the entire text. Even though Sri Krishna says, only those who come to me, he says that. But that statement, those statements have to be understood in the context of the whole scripture. Those who come to me, Sri Krishna, in many places, uses me in a sense of Ishvara. Those who come to Ishvara, not to Sri Krishna as the individual incarnation of Lord Vishnu, who ends up as Arjuna's charioteer. The statement, those who come to me, must be understood contextually. So the, the word of warning is against this, um, this tendency to be to take verses out of context and to be overly literal in the interpretation and in doing so to weaponize those teachings and cause great harm. You won't do that and now you understand kind of the, the, the why it's so wrong and why it's so harmful. There's some really important teachings to be seen yet in this verse. We will save that for our next class and conclude a couple of important announcements. Tomorrow, Sunday, we have our question answer uh, satsanga uh, tomorrow at 6 p.m. 
the weather should be nice. We met last time out in the garden. It's lovely. So come join us at 6 o'clock for satsang. We'll sit out in the garden and uh, take your questions. Oh, I should also mention I've just published a new video. Uh, if you haven't seen it, the video is on Vairagya Shatakam, this wonderful text of Bhartrahari, this great poet, and the, the poems are just delightful. It's, I, I think you'll enjoy it a lot. If, even if you don't, I, I'm not a great lover of poetry, but I love his poetry. So if you're, you might, might be pleasantly surprised, so you can find that new video. It's on Vairagya Shatakam. What is it called? The Bliss of Non-Attachment is the title of the uh, video. The Bliss of Non-Attachment. You can watch that.